when we're already paying the most for gasoline and diesel, if the carbon tax worked, you'd expect to see British Columbia's emissions decreasing. <laughs> Any guesses what we're seeing instead, folks? They are continuing to rise. This is the Canadian Taxpayers Federation podcast, where we are fighting for lower taxes, less waste and accountable government. I'm Chris Sims. I'm the Alberta director. Howdy. I'm here in Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, our good friend Franco Terrazano is holding down the fort for us in our embassy uh, deep in downtown Ottawa. Franco, thank you for uh, braving the goblins. Uh, uh, don't remind Binda. me where I am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, we've got like three feet of snow out here right now. So you guys are probably better off than we are right now. Uh, Carson Binda, he is in Vancouver. Are you allowed to be in Vancouver? You're good? Okay. Yeah, believe it or not, the uh, pitchfork and torch wielding mobs haven't chased me out <laughs> just yet, but uh, I'm sure that's against the premier's wishes there. <laughs> awesome. So Carson is our BC director, uh, which brings me to our topic du jour, and that is, of course, the carbon tax. All things carbon tax and all of the nonsense surrounding the carbon tax. Franco, do you want to lead this off? Because the circus, the, there's always a circus, but the big tent right now is definitely this building. It's definitely happening in Ottawa. What's going on? Well, we had uh, we had some two big recent votes on the carbon tax, right? The Conservative Party put in two motions, not one, but duh, and uh, forcing the government to vote on whether or not they want to increase the carbon tax, right? It was a very, at least the first motion, very simple. Do you want to increase the carbon tax again on April 1? And guess what? Uh, to, to no one's surprise, it was their motion. The conservatives voted to cancel the carbon tax hike. So kudos to them. But the motion failed because liberal NDP and block MPs all voted against the motion and voted to make our lives more expensive with a carbon tax hike. OK, now here's where all of this gets even crazier. We just released uh, some Leger polling showing that 70 percent of Canadians are against the upcoming carbon tax increase. Uh, doesn't matter where you look, which province, which demographic, the vast majority of Canadians are sick and tired of the federal government making our lives more expensive. And outside of Ottawa. Uh, fighting the carbon tax has become a multi-partisan campaign, right? You have um, liberals, NDP, conservative legislatures across the provinces speaking out. You even have the lone liberal provincial premier in Newfoundland and Labrador publicly calling on Trudeau to not raise the carbon tax again on April 1. So, look, the people stand united. Even provincial politicians stand united. The last people to the party are the liberal and NDP MPs who decided to leave their Canadians and constituents out in the cold and decided not to stand with Canadians, but to stand with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It, I've been watching it closely uh, on CPAC and from afar when we're chatting over text. Uh, what blows my mind isn't just that the NDP, which, by the way, is its same party. A lot of people don't know this. The NDP is the same party federally and provincially. They sign on to their contract, all that stuff. OK, so that's super weird to see the Alberta NDP leadership candidates here in Alberta. I know coming out against the carbon tax. I know, Carson, Crazy. your premier, David Eby, has not yet joined the party here. But to see all of these opposition leaders and leadership hopefuls within the NDP provincially saying, hey, no more carbon tax, don't at least don't hike it. And for them not to get the message at the federal level. Um, what really stuck out to me, though, this week, Franco, is the cognitive dissonance the mm -hmm. gaslighting that is going on from the government benches saying, oh, well, you get more back than you pay in. A lot of Canadians are way better off because of the carbon tax. Can you just I know I'm not trying to trigger you, but to ah. me, that is so dishonest. Right. Um, I just really want you to break down the numbers on why that is wrong for the government to be saying, oh, people are better off. Me, me imposing a carbon tax on you is making you richer. Can you explain why that's nonsense? You know, I almost feel like I'm living in a clown world. You know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, their, their final last ditch effort is to now say that somehow the carbon tax is an affordability thing. Well, I mean, it is an affordability thing in that it's making our lives less affordable. But now you have these government MPs who are trying to claim that the carbon tax is making people's lives more affordable, which is just absolutely bizarre. I mean, for starters, if they really believe that, 
then why are they raising the carbon tax from $65 a ton to $80 a ton? If they really believed what they were saying, wouldn't they just jack it up to like a million bajillion dollars a ton, right? Uh, but the, I mean, they know that their carbon tax makes lives more expensive because the government's own parliamentary budget officer, the nonpartisan independent budget watchdog, you know, similar to an auditor general in that respect. Mm -hmm. The math from the PBO shows that the carbon tax will cost the average family up to nine hundred dollars more a year than what they get back in rebates. And that net cost is only going up as Trudeau decides to continue to crank up his carbon tax year after year after year after year. And Chris, I know I'm throwing numbers around, but folks, just yeah. think of this. Think of it logically. Right. Not only do they impose a carbon tax. But they charge the GST on top of the carbon tax. Then they skim off hundreds of millions of dollars to pay for bureaucrats to administer the carbon tax. So there is no way that a government can bring in a carbon tax, charge its sales tax on top of the carbon tax, take money to pay for the bureaucrats to administer the carbon tax, and then somehow make everyone better off with rebates. It's impossible. This is what makes a lot of people, I find, tune out of politics. Because if Trudeau really wanted to defend the carbon tax and be this, you know, defender of getting rid of emissions or something, he should just own it. He should say, yeah, I know it's making things more expensive because we want people to stop using oil and gas. The problem here is many fold. The main thing, though, is people don't have an affordable, alternative, abundant energy source to switch to. They would have already. So we're getting all of the stick. OK, and none of the carrot. And now they're trying to deny that they're hitting us with the stick. And I'm going to get to you in a sec, Carson. That's one last smoking gun I find so interesting is that, OK, fine. If you're saying this is a net benefit and everybody gets super rich because of the carbon tax, then why did they give them an exemption on home heating oil? Bingo. Hmm? Bingo. Is that because is that because it was getting expensive? Yes, that's exactly why. And their seats were in jeopardy, my friend, in Atlantic Canada. And there's your politics. Hey, Chris, can I just say one yeah. last thing? I love that you yep. brought that up. And I know Carson's <laughs> eager to jump into this. Um, <laughs> he's got so much last... carbon tax stuff in BC. I know oh, <laughs> he's got two. <laughs> one, he's got almost as as much hot air over there that I have over here. Um, <laughs> but let me just like point out another thing, right? Because now yeah. the government's like kind of finally admitting that all the carbon tax really is, is like a thinly veiled redistribution scheme. But the government is now the essentially liberal MPs or ministers are essentially trying to say, but look, OK, maybe the carbon tax makes some people's lives more expensive, but it's helping low income people. OK, but hold on a second. Let's think that through. The carbon tax is a redistribution scheme, but it's not from rich multinationals to lower income individuals. That's not what's going on, right? The carbon tax is a redistribution scheme from people who have to fuel up their pickups with diesel in the morning to get to work to people who have to walk a block to get to the office. It's a redistribution scheme from people who learned how to swing a hammer for a living to people who press send on an email for a living. That is the real redistribution scheme, right? And like, think about it this way. Even if somehow in this fantasy land, the carbon tax and rebate made you better off, well, where are you getting that money from? You're getting that money from the blue collar worker down the street who is your neighbor or that small business owner down the street that is providing the community with well-paying jobs. So I just wanted to end on that note because it just drives nope. me bonkers. No, it's a great point. Uh, I happen to know a former prime minister of Canada who said and warned that this was going to ultimately be a wealth redistribution scheme and not actually help the environment. Funny that was on the bingo card. Co so Carson, it's funny, right around the same time that prime minister said something to that effect is when your province, British Columbia, my home province and place of birth, hatched the very first carbon tax in North America. You guys have had that since 2008. You guys now have two carbon taxes. So quite often when you and I are talking on Twitter or what's now called X and online and stuff, we often will hear people say, hey, we don't have a federal carbon tax in British Columbia. And I feel like replying to them saying, yes, darling, it's worse. Can you please yeah. explain BC's carbon tax? Yeah, so British Columbian drivers are hit the hardest in the country. Nowhere else in Canada even comes close to holding a candle to what BC motorists are being slapped with every time they fill up their minivan to take their kids to hockey practice or fill up the uh, pickup truck to go to work. 
The simple fact is British Columbians are being raked over the coals here. And to give you all a little bit of a history lesson, way back when BC first introduced this carbon tax, the NDP were railing against it. (laughs) Premier John Horgan, uh, who wasn't premier yet, he was opposition leader of the NDP, said British Columbians won't be able to heat their homes when the wild west coast winds are howling. Well, I think the NDP has forgotten all about that. They forgot that British Columbians need to heat their homes in the wintertime because on April 1st, just like the feds, Premier David Eby is jacking up the carbon tax. Now, when we're already paying the most for gasoline and diesel, if the carbon tax worked, you'd expect to see British Columbia's emissions decreasing. (laughs) Any guesses what we're seeing instead, folks? They are continuing to rise. In the past decade alone, if you look at 2011 to 2021, which is the most recent year we have government numbers for, British Columbia's CO2 emissions keep on ticking up. So this carbon tax isn't working in BC. It's just leaving normal families worse off than if we didn't have it. Yeah, exactly. And you also have a second carbon tax and your rebates, as much as I don't like using that word anymore, because I've got like shell shock from this past week watching the House of Commons, your rebates are chicken feed, like unbelievable. You are, I think last I checked with the numbers, a two person working family making around 75,000. So combined income. Okay. You're cut off completely. You don't get any rebates. Zero, my friend. And again, this is in British Columbia, where it has one of the highest costs of living in all of Canada. A little more of a history lesson on BC, too, because I can hear some people right now listening in British Columbia. Well, our carbon tax used to be revenue neutral. Okay, that was true for the first two-ish years. Okay, I want to be really precise here, because at the time, B.C. Liberal Premier Gordon Campbell brought in his carbon tax. He did do a corresponding income tax cut. Boom. Okay, you could argue that's revenue neutral. Fine. It did not take the B.C. Liberal government long, though, to start cooking those books. Okay, you can take a look back at their past budgets and they had the revenue column for the B.C. carbon tax. And then they started stuffing all these random old tax credits right into it to make it balance out to zero. And the bureaucrats themselves said, this has always just been an accounting exercise, my friend, meaning it was not revenue neutral, even when the BC liberals had imposed it on people. So I just wanted to give that little footnote because I know you guys are in a big rigmarole right now, provincially over the carbon tax. Is this a fight, provincially speaking? Like when you're listening to the talking heads of the Victoria and stuff, are they talking about it provincially speaking? Oh, Chris, this is a fight that is heating up. Not only are our provincial politicians talking about this, uh, both John Rustad from the BC Conservatives and Kevin Falcon from BC United have been calling on Premier Eby to cancel this carbon tax hike, which people can't afford. But increasingly, federal politicians like Pierre Polyev are starting to wade into this BC carbon tax fight. Um, the Premier, David Eby, and Pierre Polyev have been shooting back and forth uh, with each other Uh, over this. So this is a fight that's heating up. It's a fight that people care about because they know that the carbon tax makes everything more expensive. You know, I was chatting with, with some folks up in Prince George this morning, and they were saying that everything that gets to their community gets there either by rail or by truck. Those are modes of transport that pay the carbon tax. So everything a family in Prince George picks up at the grocery store that's being slapped with the carbon tax. It raises the cost of living on everything, not just when you fill up the pickup truck or when you heat your home with natural gas, but the groceries you're buying at the store, the new t-shirt you're buying for your kid's first day of school, all of those things are hit with the carbon tax. So it's making life unaffordable in BC and people are starting to see that. Good, I'm so glad the message is finally getting through. And it's it's nice to be able to see this being front and center. Uh, Franco, federally, where do you see the puck going now? Like if you were Gretzky and you were looking at the ice and you're looking at where the puck is going on the mm. carbon tax, what's the next play here? What's the next fight? Oh, man. You know, I'm uh, I'm so in the in the fight right now that it's 
it's almost like you're losing what's the, what's the phrasing like you're losing the uh trees through the forest or the forest through the yeah. trees <laughs> but anyways like when you're so in it it's tough to kind of see all of what's going on because you're just day-to-day -day reacting and you're fighting and you're and you're doing your best for taxpayers but so i don't know exactly if the government is is going to halt the april one carbon tax hike or scrap it like i honestly don't know but folks like these things can move really quickly um, yes. You know, remember, we all remember the carbon tax carve out furnace oil removed for the carbon tax, the political ploy to help Atlantic Canadians. We all remember that. But folks, nobody knew that was going to happen. So I was actually like thought the day was kind of over, ready to go to the gym for an early lift. And then I got an email. I, I think it might have been from CTV saying, hey, um, can you come on and talk about uh, Trudeau's announcement? And I'm like, what announcement? And they said, uh, well, it's going to have to do with affordability and it might have environmental implications. So I was like, oh, my gosh, like what's going to happen? So even like a couple hours before that announcement, nobody really knew what was going on. And that just kind of shows how quickly things can move. Like, who knows? Maybe after this conversation, I'm optimistic. Maybe we have some great news. Um, you know, I won't hold my breath. But anyways, so I don't know exactly what's going to happen with the carbon tax. But what I do know to any liberal MP who might be listening is that you think you've got it bad now. You ain't seen nothing yet. OK, yeah. if somehow you can skate by this year's carbon tax hike, well, there's going to be another carbon tax hike next year, months before the next federal election. So do you really want to be knocking on doors, singing for soup months after you just hiked the carbon tax again? And if somehow you're able to skate by the two next carbon tax increases, <laughs> well, folks, Trudeau wants to raise the carbon tax from the current 14 cents a liter of gas to 37 cents per liter of gas. Beep, boop, beep, boop. That's like a 160% increase. Now, if you think that it's going to get any easier for you after your government raises the carbon tax by like 160% by 2030, you've got another thing coming. So I guess the only thing I can predict is that if liberal MPs are feeling the pressure now, it's only going to get worse. I guess that's all I can really say for sure. Yeah, it is only going to get worse. And um, have it, I worked on the Hill for a long time and it's funny it's like a submarine. Everything can look fine on the surface for a long time until suddenly it's not OK and it crushes. And so I think that is what is going to happen with the pressure around this particular. It's affordability largely. And I think specifically, I think this carbon tax thing has now finally lodged itself in the consciousness of a lot of voters. And they're saying, excuse me, what? Why are you increasing my cost of living on everything? when it is not actually helping the environment. Um, do we want to get into booze taxes here and alcohol tax? Because yeah. we have we have some OK, we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is you're not you're only getting punched in the face twice instead of four times. I stole your line there, Franco. Um, but the bad news is that you're still getting punched in the face. Uh, who wants to take this one away? How much are our alcohol taxes going up by and what the heck is an escalator tax? Yeah, I'll jump in here if, okay. uh, if that's okay. Alcohol right now, today, before the increase on April 1st, about 50% the price you pay for things like beer, wine, or spirits, that is all taxes right off the top, half the price you pay. So if I want to buy a bottle of wine to crack with my better half uh, this Friday evening and it's $20, $10 of that is going straight to the tax man, out of my pocket and straight to the feds and provincial government. That's an issue. But hold on, folks, because it gets even worse. Way back in 2017, uh, Justin Trudeau introduced what we call the escalator tax. That means that the, the tax burden on alcoholic beverages goes up automatically without a single vote in Parliament every year on April 1st indexed to inflation. Um, and that's a problem for a whole whack of reasons. One, this is already taxed to high heaven. You know, when already you're paying 50% of the sticker price in taxes, that's a big tax burden. But the other big issue here is how undemocratic it is. Look, we pay for 338 MPs to sit in Ottawa. We pay them as taxpayers a six-figure salary to vote oh, yeah. on things like tax hikes. 
But they're saying, hold on here. We don't want to vote on these tax sites. We're just going to approve them going through automatically. That's a huge issue. It makes a mockery of our democratic institutions. Why do we have these 338 MPs who we pay six-figure salaries to if they're not even going to vote on the things that make life more expensive for Canadians? It boggles my mind here, Chris. Yeah, hey, we could get, um, you know, an algorithm to do this for free, couldn't we, Franco? Yeah, that's what I was just, <laughs> you're, you might be wondering while I was looking down on my phone and I'm just trying to beep, boop, beep, boop, crunch some numbers as quickly as I did last time. Um, so, I mean, Carson, you know, you really nailed it on the issue of, well, both affordability, right? You go to the bar, you pick up a, you, you go pick up some Pilsner, have a nice little drink with the boys, you know, the, pick up that bottle of, uh, bottle of Pinot, have that drink with the other half. You pick or up box, that Mickey. Just saying, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you pick up that Mickey rum because Chris, your kids have been driving you nuts all week or your boss has been driving you nuts all week. <laughs> talking about you, Todd. Um, <laughs> Right. But every time you, you go pick up alcohol, you're already paying half of the price, a little bit more than half the price in tax. OK, yeah. absolutely crazy. I mean, there's a couple provinces in Canada where the total tax bill is more than the actual retail price of a case of beer in half of the American states. And anyone who's um, went to the U.S., like you instantly know how much cheaper a case of beer is at the store than when you're in Canada. And now the, what the federal government is doing is they were going to raise the alcohol tax by 4.7% on April 1. Happy April Fool's Day. And instead, they're still going to raise the tax, but by 2%. OK, so I mean, look, um, a smaller tax hike is better than a bigger tax hike. But that tax increase will still cost Canadian taxpayers about $40 million over the year. OK, and. Another thing that the government is doing, I mean, to their credit, they actually are providing some relief. Um, let me just here. I just pulled it up here. I just wanted to get this right. They are mm -hmm. cutting their excise tax in half for the first 15,000 hectoliters of beer brewed in Canada. So there will be some actual tax cut. And I think that's mostly going to help like craft breweries, like small craft breweries. So. OK, but the real thing to remember is that main federal excise tax, instead of going up from 4.7 percent, it's going up by 2 percent. Now, I do want to give kudos where kudos is due. The only reason the only reason that this government is not raising the tax by even more is because of CTF supporters getting off the bench and kudos Carson leading the campaign against this alcohol tax hike. So, Carson, why don't you kind of talk about what our supporters did to, like, make this government not raise the tax as much? Yeah, our supporters, and I'm not exaggerating here, sent thousands and thousands and thousands of emails to politicians like Christia Freeland, who's in charge of this, uh, this tax hike, telling her that we just can't afford it. British Columbians and Canadians from coast to coast to coast to coast can't afford to pay more um, for things like wine. Mm -hmm. And also really hammering home that accountability and democracy angle. We're paying your salary. The least you can do is vote on the things that will impact our lives and affordability for us. So CTF supporters from across the country sent thousands of emails to their MPs, to the Minister of Finance, and got involved in this fight. So this is proof, guys. When, our, when we ask our supporters to write an email to the politicians, when we tell them, look, a critical vote is coming up and your voice can have all the difference, well, the proof's in the pudding here. This only happened because our supporters got up off the bench made their voices heard, and forced the politicians to listen. So the kudos are all on our supporters here, on our taxpayer army across Canada who said enough is enough. We're not going to st uh, stand for this. Nice. And that's why the federal government had to back off. Nice. I hope this carries over to the carbon tax as well and all these other tax hikes that are coming. Uh, do you want to give your taxpayer pro tip here, Franco? Yes, I do. Okay, so... Okay. Carson's first uh, time on the updated podcast, he gets to hear these taxpayer pro tips where we, you know, give politicians a little bit of a pro tip. So my pro tip is actually going to go out to uh, Liberal and NDP 
MPs, specifically the backbenchers, so none of the liberal cabinet ministers. I mean, I hope they take this advice too. And remember when we got started at the beginning where we had the motion, the vote on whether or not MPs want to raise the carbon tax on April 1. Well, the reason the motion failed is essentially because liberal and NDP MPs voted to crank up your carbon taxes, right? Everyone knew the bloc was going to uh, vote against the motion because Quebec doesn't pay the federal carbon tax. So this really falls on the liberal and NDP members of parliament, okay? If you're listening to this, my pro tip to you is to stand with your constituents instead of standing with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Yep. Yep. Read the room, guys. Read the room. Now is the time, if ever, to listen to your constituents and pay attention to them, which leads me to my taxpayer pro tip, uh, which is I'm doing the exact same, but the other end of the telescope here, Franco. And that is to the folks listening who are disheartened. They're losing hope. They don't think any of their words matter. And picking up on Carson's point, yeah, they really do. So politicians are masters at looking cool and collected on the outside, but freaking out inside. OK, they're like a duck. OK, everything's fine on the surface and underneath the surface, they're paddling like crazy. They are freaking out right now because they're under so much pressure. And the reason why they're under so much pressure is because of taxpayers and voters and constituents like you that are phoning their offices, emailing their offices and saying, hey, Quit making my life so much more expensive and quit telling me this fairy story that I'm richer because of your carbon tax. I'm not stupid. Cut mm. this carbon tax. And so I wanted to encourage everybody that's like, oh, well, my email doesn't matter. My petition signature doesn't matter. It really does. I promise you it does. I've worked in a constituency office before. I've worked on a Hill office before. For every one phone call or letter they get from somebody, they assume a hundred other people think the same way you start getting up into the thousands of emails they're freaking out they're scared for their own jobs and their own hides so i just wanted to encourage everybody across the political spectrum if you want to push your politician to take action pick up that phone uh carson did you have one to give to our our listeners here our taxpayer pro tip yeah my taxpayer pro tip is going out to david eby it's pretty simple think about the families man Families right now in British Columbia are going to food banks in record-breaking numbers. Rent, mortgages have never been more expensive, so homelessness is reaching all-time highs yeah. here in BC. Folks can't afford to keep a roof over their head to feed their kids. Do the right thing. Stand up for British Columbians. Stand with us, not with Trudeau. And don't hike the carbon tax on April 1st. Bonus points, scrap the thing altogether. Excellent. Wonderful tips from both of you gentlemen. Uh, folks, ready to wrap up? Ready to give my pitch to the website here? Okay. So, folks, if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, these guys seem to be enjoying <laughs> their fight against the politicians and taxes, you're right. We have to be happy warriors for two reasons. One, because if you don't laugh, you're going to cry because some of this stuff can get pretty heavy. High taxes, debt load, all that stuff. And two politicians and bureaucrats hate it when you laugh at them they hate it they get they're really so really uppity they're right? so important they're so, right they're like some grand duke somewhere you know exactly exactly you see and so i could do the female equivalent right so folks join our fight join the taxpayer standing army one you can get involved in some of these campaigns and do mass emails two it's fun and there's a bit of fellowship involved here because you realize you're not alone, you're not the crazy one, and that you too can join up with other people and fight against things like lower taxes and fight for things like more accountability. So head on over to our website, taxpayer.com. That's where we're fighting for taxpayers.